Welcome to the Ultimate Landscape CEO. My guest for a second time is Mike Bogan, co-owner, President Landcare. On the first time I brought Mike to our podcast, we spoke a lot about the land care history and the history of the landscape industry, if you will. And we did speak about land care, but we didn't get into the nuts and bolts of Mike's business philosophy. And so on this podcast, we dive into what makes land care different. We talk about his systems, his purpose. We talk about what it really means to put people first. And we speak about different books. Conscious Capitalism is a one concept, one book we speak about. And we speak about a few other books. We talk about how he manages using core values and how that was really a turning point for his business. We spend a bunch of time talking about incentives, commissions, and in land care, they're really a believer of only doing profit sharing. And whether you feel this is right for your business or not, it's still a great example of someone who's really implementing it, putting it to the test, if you will, and scaling an entire business on just profit sharing and other benefits um, as the incentive, if you will. And he really, Mike speaks a lot about how to what it means to put people first and to make work as enjoyable as life. And Mike really believes this and, and shares a lot of his passion for it and enthusiasm. And we end on the platinum rule, which sums up how he um, goes about uh, treating the customer, but it's really the same way that he treats his employees. Uh, we get into some of the ways they train their employees to understand and operate by the different belief systems they have in their business. Very instructive on how to scale one's business. And by the way, if you've just come to this podcast and didn't learn about it through my newsletter, you can sign up for my weekly newsletter growth tips at from my website at jeffrey, uh, jeffreyscott.biz is the uh, URL. And you can go to the homepage and Find that right on top a way to subscribe to my newsletter. I hope you enjoy this follow up part two segment with Mike Bogan. Mike, welcome back to the show. Hey, Jeffrey. Great to uh, have a little bit more time together and excited to share a little bit more with you about land care and um, our company and what we're doing and maybe a little bit about what makes us different. Excellent. You know, I have never had a owner back a second time yet. I'm sure that this won't be the first. I've had um, an economist come on a few times just because the economy is always changing. So you are the you're the first. Well, I'm flattered. I'm flattered that you're interested in hearing more about our story and uh, in what we're doing. And I know the last time we spoke, um, there was a lot of history in there, which for some people may be very, very familiar. I'm yeah. sure there are listeners that lived it to, uh, to different degrees, but um, yeah. for others, maybe good to understand where we came from and how we got here. Yeah, we and so we really left off, If for those listening, if you haven't heard that, go back and listen to the part one, if you will. Uh, but we we did sort of leave off with, we didn't really dig into the inside of land care. And I, and I'm, so I'm really glad we're doing this. And so let me just start with, um, why is land care different? Yeah. Um, well, I think that the, the reasons we're different will be interesting to chat about, but the, but the, how are we different or why are we different? I think is, um, uh, what's most important. And that's that we put our people first. Yeah. Um, and I think that comes out in a lot of different ways. Um, perhaps a lot of people can say that, you know, uh, about their companies, but I, I'll describe some of the ways we live it um, that are really exciting. Um, one of our mutual friends, Jeffrey, uh, Pam Dooley, um, okay. shared a book with me um, a couple of months ago um, called Winning on Purpose. Uh, mm. The author is Frederick Reicheld and um, he's familiar maybe to some of our listeners uh, as the author of 
NPS or net promoter score, which sure. is a, uh, a popular measure for customers or for companies to um, determine if they're on the right track for growth and, uh, and what to uh, expect in their business. And I, in I, winning on, yeah. Let me just, let me just interrupt. Uh, I'm seeing a really positive trend with people doing this ENPS or employee net promoter score. So they're doing it internally. And mm -hmm. I almost think that's more valuable depending on your business. It's a really important question. We ask that of our employees as well, which is, would you recommend land care to a friend, uh, family member or colleague as a place to work? Mm. And uh, I think it's, uh, it's really telling and maybe one of the top measures of whether or not they're having an experience that they want to share with others. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So anyway, in the book, um, Winning on Purpose, there's a quote that uh, resonated with me uh, perhaps more than, uh, than any other in recent years. And that was great companies help people lead great lives. Mm. And I just thought, wow, what a, uh, what, what a great inspiration to be in business, like, like the intention around why are you doing this? So great companies uh, help people lead great lives. Um, he finishes that with, uh, by saying they are a force for good. Mm -hmm. And I think that that says a mouthful. Um, and, uh, and our leadership team has been very inspired by that and the way we think about uh, our decisions. Um, so I said, we put people first and um, I don't know, you know, I can jump in a little bit about what that means for us if you're interested. Sure. Okay. So um, one of the ways that it, uh, it really shows up is that we follow uh, the tenets of conscious capitalism. So I'm not sure how familiar you are with conscious capitalism. Mm -hmm. um, it's, a, it's a principle that's been out there for, uh, for a while. You'll hear is things. The, is that the B Corporation? Yep. Yep. Absolutely tied to, uh, to, to that. Um, as we think about it, and as we, we look at what it means for our business, it means that instead of being uh, a business that focuses on the shareholder, which is you know, to say return on investment uh, for, uh, for those that fund the business, um, which is what a lot of people would describe as the purest form of capitalism. Um, we focus on all of the stakeholders. So everyone who's impacted by the way we run our business. So yeah. there's a, uh, a group of six um, stakeholders and we actually rank them. We, we put them and how we think of their importance to us and the business decisions that we make day in and day out. Um, so we start with our employees as the number one stakeholder. They are so impacted by the decisions we make and, and how we run our business. Um, we go to our customers, the ones that we serve, who choose us, uh, hopefully, um, uh, to be their contractor. Um, we look at the vendors, the, the partners that provide us with the um, the goods and services that uh, that we pass on to our our customers. Uh, we look at the communities that we serve, um, the, the the cities that we operate in, um, the environment, uh, which uh, allows us to do the things that we do, and and our work can be very impactful to it. And then finally, our shareholders. And um, we believe that if we do the right things by the first five. Um, then anything we do for our shareholders is honorable and um, we can be really proud of those returns. If we disregard the needs of the first five, then we don't feel great about creating returns uh, for number six. Gotcha. Okay. And these yeah. are the, the irony. I don't know if that's the right word, but the irony is your leadership team are the shareholders. For the most part, we are the shareholders. Yeah, we are. Uh, we own the majority of the business, and um, and that's really helpful too, right? To have the the people that are making the decisions um, in the position to do that, right? So that uh, instead of having outside forces, a board of directors who's looking out for a group of investors, say, um, drive decisions in a certain way, our team can look at um, how we're living, uh, measured against our own core values, to determine how those decisions are made. By the way, last time we spoke, you mentioned that you were, you know, not buying businesses nor selling yours. And so does that decision, is that a separate from these priorities or does it interconnect? No, I think, no, that's a good question. Um, 
and look, we we do acquire companies. It's just not our um, uh, driving mission to uh, to roll businesses up or to um, uh, significantly grow EBITDA by looking for companies to add into our business. We do it when it just makes sense for other reasons. It's yeah. um, it's somebody that we know, have familiarity with, and um, and will fit well into our culture and really believes in what we're doing and, and want to be part of it. So that's uh, you know more of a driver. Um, and uh, yeah, it's it's part of what we. But driven by conscious capitalism, no. But I think that. Uh, the ability to um, to not get caught up in what's going on with the rest of the industry or many yeah. parts of it, at least, um, is easier for us because uh, of where our values sit. So, um, so really, if I look at your list, the chase of acquisition really would take you away from that list. It could. It could. Right. It could. Um, it could mean that you're looking at Look, we think of things as a system. And I'm sure you've heard this comment before um, that systems are perfectly designed to give the results that they give. So what does that mean? I'll, I'll, I'll break that down into an example and I'll say it again. Systems are perfectly designed to give the results that they give. So mm -hmm. in our business, for example, um, we at one time had uh, a job position called area manager and it had multiple responsibilities. Um, they, the position was responsible for quality on the job sites, uh, for safety, making sure our teams were working properly and looking out for each other, um, for training, making sure people knew how to do the things that they do right, um, uh, the proper way, uh, for customer service, um, and for enhancement sales. And enhancement sales were commissioned but none of the other uh, aspects of the job uh, mm -hmm. were measured or rewarded. Yeah. And so you can imagine in that system where the attention was drawn to. The attention was drawn to enhancement sales over some of these other very important things. You know, uh, safety of our team members is absolutely paramount, but it wasn't being rewarded. The, mm -hmm. the behavior that was being rewarded was selling um, work to our customers. And so that's where the attention was focused. Some of these other things uh, did not get the, the proper amount of focus by our team members and um, you know, the results were what you'd think they might be. So um, systems are designed to give you the results that you get. So I'll, I'll speak for a second to ownership structure because I think this is where this ties into our ability to be focused the way we are. Um, from an ownership standpoint, uh, if you are a public company or if you are owned by private equity, um, you are looked at at least by the owners as a financial asset mm -hmm. and one that must be bought and sold. That's yeah. that's why they're purchased in the first place. And um, look, I know you understand well how private equity works. I'll, I'll take just a, a quick second for maybe some of the listeners to you know, get a, a clearer view because you hear that a lot. Um, in our industry today, and uh, and it's very present um, in all industries, but certainly in, in landscaping right now. Um, sure. so, so private equity are simply bankers that um, were investors to give them money uh, to uh, go out and purchase companies. So the investors are money managers. They might work for a pension fund. Um, they might work for wealthy families. Um, they might work for a mutual fund, but they, they're taking uh, money and they are giving it to bankers to go out and make more money with. And um, bankers then take that money and they buy companies. Um, they operate them for three to five years and they sell them with mm -hmm. the intention, of, pretty simply, of selling it for more than they bought it for. Um, and that's how they give a return to their investors who are, are their clients. Um, at the end of the day, when they're trying to raise their next fund, the most important thing they can point to is ROI, return on investment. What did we do with the money that we were given the last time and how much more did we make with it? Yeah. Um, that is the ultimate measure, as you can imagine. That's, that's what happens there. So in that system, um, do, uh, do bankers, when they're raising their next fund, do they tout the lives that they changed? Do they tout the, the benefits that they 
uh, created for people. Um, they, they may have a line somewhere in their books about that, but their number one focus is always going to be ROI. And, sure. um, and that's the nature of it. So look, I'm not saying it's evil or bad or that companies can't operate effectively in that, but it's a system with a specific design and, and you're going to have to kind of uh, fight your way away from that in order to still do things that are important for your team members along it, the way. It's a short term focus, which really, therefore, how do you make an impact? Yeah. You know, because in theory, you're also making a financial impact, but you're going at it a different route. Yeah. And and what is the, the owners, the people that have um, uh, something to gain if the, uh, if the shares gain value um, also have to be locked in on these other values, these core values that we profess as a company. Um, and those drive our decisions every day. And you know, here's an example of, of one of those decisions that, that makes me proud. We were um, uh, in third quarter this year, feeling a little drag on the business as probably many businesses did this year with, with cost up, um, labor and materials costing more than they ever have in the past. Um, many of our prices locked in for the year, fuel prices through the roof. I mean, we, we all knew these stories um, as the summer progressed. And we were looking at expanding benefits for um, our crew members, our hourly crew members, and specifically um, increasing the number of paid holidays for them so that they matched what our management staff receives. So previously, um, they had six days of vacation. Our managers enjoyed, uh, in, uh, enjoyed nine days of vacation. So as we looked at um, um, Thanksgiving, Christmas, and New Year's, we wanted to make their holidays match um, what the leaders um, of, of the company were getting so that everybody from the hourly employee to the, the account managers to our senior leaders were in the same boat. Um, a business our size, that's about a $2 million expense to go out and add those paid holidays. We could simply look at our core values and ask ourselves if that was what was important to us to make that decision without having to think about, well, what impact is that going to have on EBITDA and how far are we from our next transaction um, so that we can maximize uh, an exit. Mm -hmm. That's an example of being able to say, hey, alignment by our management team, um, decision-making power to do what fits our values and putting employees first, um, you know, how all that comes out and, and helps lead us down the right path. Do you think there's a trend, uh, this is more of a sidebar, but do you think there's a trend of uh, turning on its head and giving frontline more benefits than managers or the, or the same? Is there a trend like across the country? I don't see that trend. I wish there was, um, yeah. but, uh, but I know it's certainly important to our uh, leaders. And um, look, at the end of the day, we want to be the employer of choice. It has a direct benefit to us um, in terms of being able to grow our business and um, not be concerned about having enough team members. But I can assure you that's not the driver. The driver is to run the business in a way that we're really proud of and yeah. is consistent with those values. Yeah. Well, a couple of weeks ago, I took a peer group to visit Larry Ryan. Have you been to his company? I haven't, but I'm familiar with it. I, Ryan, I, I know it by name. Yeah. Yeah. Ryan Lawn and Tree. He, and I wrote a newsletter on it. It'll go out tomorrow. And um, you guys are a lot alike. You probably, I think you'd, you'd like him. Mm -hmm. uh, also, what well, I hope we have the chance to spend some time together. There are so many great leaders in this industry. And um, and I've learned so much from so many of them. And, and having the chance to connect and share stories and find alignment uh, is where you get a lot of inspiration, too. And, and I love being part of that. We were, he, he mentioned a quote, which is something I've always quoted the same person, but I didn't know it. Uh, uh, Truett Cathy about, and I forget what his quote is, but my version is, if you want a bigger company, build a better company. Mm. But, I like it. But aiming to build a bigger company doesn't get you a better company. So. For sure. You, there's a lot of ways to get big. Right. We've right. talked about M&A as an example. Um, M&A is, uh, you know, getting big that way is a reflection of how much money you have to spend uh, and less a reflection of you know, how well you're doing things. So true. Kathy's quote was, if you build a better company, your clients 
will demand that you get bigger. Mm. I like it. I think that uh, that probably speaks to that net promoter score that um, that we were speaking about earlier. Yeah. Yeah. And it sounds like what you're trying to do more or less. Right. And it uh, is. It is. We're we're trying to focus on um, being a great company, run it in a way that we're really proud and uh, and having team members really buy into what we're doing, uh, give their all towards the mission. And I think that success will flow from that. Are there other systems you wanted to mention that makes Landcare different? Well, I think um, our mindset on our core values and what we're here for. So this is less about being a system, but more about um, a thought process that shows up in our business. So um, uh, look, at the, at the end of the day, employment, work, a job can be um, at its lowest form, an exchange of effort for money. Uh, an employee comes in, they sell you their energy to accomplish a task. You buy it from them, you pay them, um, and they leave. And I think that's you know probably the lowest form of uh, of having a job and, and going to work. You know, the opposite, from my perspective, the highest form would be really giving somebody a great experience when they come to work every day. And, you know, going back to that quote I used earlier, helping people lead great lives. And when I think about that and, and what it means for a team member um, being at work, at work should mean that they get to live life to their fullest. They get to have great experiences. They get to do something that they enjoy doing. The, they get to be proud of doing it in a good way. Um, they get to be inspired, uh, they get to inspire others. So while they're having good experiences happen to them, they're also providing good experiences for other people. Um, they get to learn, they get to grow, they get to be challenged, they get to develop meaningful relationships with other people. Um, all of these things should be part of what happens when you come to work. And I think when you're at your best as a company, you're providing that experience for everyone, your managers, your, your hourly team members out in the field, everyone gets to have some level of that full experience, not just selling energy uh, every day. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I, I, I talk a lot uh, about that work-life balance and uh, you've probably heard me mention it before, but you know, this idea that um, work and life are on opposite ends of a scale. And to get more of one, you have to have less of the other. I just wholeheartedly reject. I think that you should have life at work and that work should be an extension of all the good things that you enjoy. Um, and life shouldn't be something that starts when you stop working. Um, mm. You ought to be able to blend those well together. Yeah, it's interesting. I was just talking to Paul Friend, who you know as well, Mm -hmm. And he was coming at it from the opposite, but the same perspective where because he travels a lot for life, but he's still working. So for him, he doesn't, he says there's no such thing, but sort of the opposite reason. Yeah, uh, sometimes you're the, the way you work, you can blend those together. And um, whether it's, uh, you know, at the middle of the day on a Tuesday or um, or in the middle of the morning on a Sunday, you know, you're, you're, you're thinking about doing the things that, um, that drive your business and, and you're engaged in that. And I think more senior leaders probably are that way, right? You, it's hard to ever just completely put it away and, and shift your brain away from it. Yeah. But I certainly experience what, what Paul's sharing. So how do you do this for your employees? How do you make work feel as, I guess, as enjoyable as life? Yeah, one of the things we do is we focus on what interpersonal relationships feel like between people. And we actually do training around that. So uh, our team members go through the seven habits of highly effective people, which is um, a book first and foremost written by Stephen Covey. And, and it's also a training program, which teaches you how to put those principles um, into practice uh, mm -hmm. at work and at home and in your personal life. Um, but um, we focus on that because we believe it's enriching and it changes the way people think of interacting with each other throughout the day. So, you know, instead of um, being told what to do, 
um, you have some say in, in what you're doing um, instead of people trying to make sure that everybody understands what they need to do to please them. Um, they try to understand what the, uh, what the employees need first and, uh, and then communicate in a more effective way. So these tools um, help create a different kind of environment at work. Um, look, we're not perfect with it. Uh, I'd be the you know, first to point that out. It's, um, I think these ideas for us um, are so uh, grand and take so much to achieve in a really effective way that they become aspirational. They're, they're part of what we see we're, ourselves as, what we want to be when, uh, when we've got our business clicking the way we, we hope we can uh, you know, get the business to run. But, uh, but they're things that drive us and drive our decisions on a daily basis. I really like that. I've always believed that there should be a set of skills unique to every company's culture that you need your executives to know. Like to be on the executive team, besides knowing your job and the values, you need to know these seven skills or something. And it, <clears throat> I've always been a believer in that. And I, I sort of look for that out in the world. And this is sort of a an example of that. Yeah, I uh, appreciate you pointing that out. I think it is too. You know, we we teach our leaders, our managers. We've moved away from the idea of annual performance reviews, and we now instead teach our managers to be coaches. So, if you think about like the sports analogy, um, if you kept all your feedback uh, until the end of the season, and you sat down and you told somebody what they were doing right or wrong. Right you wouldn't have a chance to, uh, to make corrections. And sure. much like uh, coaching, um, there are a number of different things you can do. You can do um, in the moment, you know, during the game, shouting from the sidelines to, uh, to help uh, a player make a correction. Um, you can have a timeout or a halftime where you get to be a little bit more thoughtful and planful in, in that feedback and, and course correct in a way that can still uh, affect the outcome. And then midweek, you know, after the game's over, um, looking at the game film and where you've got time to be even much more thoughtful and introspective, really give feedback and, and try to help a team member improve in an area that can change their performance or really point out something that they're doing well so that they can, can continue to build on it. And that coaching idea has pulled us away from this idea of um, having real formal uh, feedback sessions, which any surveys will tell you, um, managers don't like them, employees don't like them. They're they're just right. not uh, comfortable environments to be in. They so we tried them. to, yeah, exactly. So we've we've tried to replace that um, with coaching, and uh, we had a uh, a full work session with all of our managers trying to teach those skills and um, how to identify them and, and how to use them effectively in the business. So those are some of the ways that we're trying to be. Um, more employee centric and, and create a different kind of environment and create skills that our leaders really need to possess in order to uh, to lead our teams the right way. Uh, a couple questions. Um, mm -hmm. <clears throat> uh, I'm going to ask one. Hopefully, I won't forget the other. But yeah, <laughs> there's there's a few different coaching methods or systems out there, and some are built into softwares like fifteen five, I think it's called, and so do you have a branded or type of approach that you like most? No, we've taken ideas from, uh, from a number of different leaders um, and books that we've read um, uh, where, you know, Fierce Conversations and Radical Candor uh, are two books out there that talk about the importance of being really open and honest with each other and, mm -hmm. and putting the facts on the table and, um, you know, I, I truly believe not telling somebody what you think isn't fair and, yeah. uh, and is, is a kind of a perverse, uh, form of cruelty, uh, to, to withhold that and, uh, and yet sharing it in a way that it's going to be accepted and heard. Um, you know, Stephen Covey talks about emotional bank accounts, building up the, uh, the ability to take a withdrawal by first making deposits and, yeah. Um, that really plays out a lot in this coaching idea. If all you have is criticism, people really get tired of that. And if you can't point out constructively the good things that they're doing as well, um, it's hard to um, to always be 
uh, trying to correct. And we see that in our own lives, right? With our, our family members, our children, you know, anybody that we interact with on a regular basis. But sorry, I drifted away from your question. Is there a technology that we're embracing? There's not. There's not a specific technology that we're embracing. Okay. We're uh, really just trying to focus on the, the soft skills for our people. So the other question I have is, uh, if let's say every couple of years you explore a new thing, tool to bring into the toolkit and everybody in the company does it, but, or I don't know if it's a but, <laughs> what happens when you have like a new employee? Is it, to, did they miss it? And so they don't get that past training yeah. or do you guys like <laughs> circle around and circle around back to it? We do. Um, and we we work uh, every year to assess what should be foundational for our team members. So what everybody should get and more of kind of what's um, in the moment learning that maybe just applicable today because of where culturally the world is, but may change uh, yeah. again uh, a couple of years later. So um, we do. We, uh, we took all of our company as teams through Seven Habits training uh, years ago. And now we're on a program where every couple of years we'll redo it again and kind of bring it back and get all the new team members together. Um, and then we do uh, we do study uh, sessions or study guidelines that we give out to our leaders so that they can continue to touch on those things along the way. Um, we have orientation where we try to give uh, a um, uh, a quick you know get up to speed to um, to new team members. Um, some of that requires a little bit of self study. Um, but if it's reading a book that we've all identified as something that uh, resonates with us and fits our culture, um, they're going to hear that language and those ideas showing up in their team meetings and interactions. And so often they may have to read the book on their own, but then they have the chance to kind of catch up or, or, um, or chime in with their team as they use those things at work going yeah. forward. Well, that's good to hear because I think it's easy to have the program du jour and it is. Yeah. And when your business is growing, um, I mean, obviously we have turnover as well, uh, but with growth, we're always going to have a, a new set of team members and you get three years down the road and you realize, oh, some of these team members weren't there when, when we started this journey. Something that caught my attention when you emailed me originally, a, I don't know, a month ago or so, you said one of the key moments was when you solidified the core values for Landcare. And I thought, but well, Landcare is an old company and big. It was surprising, at least when I read the email, how it hadn't done that yet. But then I learned the context, it kind of made sense. Um, but do you want to share that with the yeah. audience? Yeah, I think these core values for us, um, I mentioned the term aspirational earlier. They're what we want to be. We're, we try to have a pretty humble culture, Jeffrey, and and check ourselves and, and talk about um, what we're not doing well, as opposed to, you know, what we have to stand back and be proud of. And, um, and I think that always keeps us hungry and, and trying to push and improve our business. But when it comes to our core values, um, our team members created those. Um, it was feedback from them that, that helped us solidify what those values would be that we would live by. And we think of them as guardrails, as kind of the things that keep us on the right path. So um, if uh, we can call each other out and our team members do, if, uh, if a manager um, were to suggest something that isn't consistent, I mean, here's an example. We may have a customer um, who we discover we've, we've mispriced the work for. We're undercharging them for what we're doing which happens in you know, landscape estimates. You, you think you know what it's gonna to take to get the work done. Sometimes you underbid. Um, if we had a manager that said, well, it's, you know, it's coming into the fall and we've been underwater on this client, let's, let's cut some of the services at the end of the year and try to get this back to a fair exchange. Well, our team members are fully empowered to say, hey, how is that living with integrity? If we yeah. told the customer we were gonna do a third fertilization this fall, then we need to do the third fertilization this fall. That's not up in the air. It's not a question about that. It's it's just doing what's right. That may seem simple, but look, our our team members are all trying to um, to grow our business and to have strong financial results, and and um, those core values help make sure that we're doing the right thing, no matter how many other. Um, outside influences or ideas may creep into the to the way we think about 
um, getting to the end solution. Um, another example, uh, you know, we have a core value around having fun. And that might sound kind of weird in a business situation, but I believe, as I said earlier, that you should live at work and that you should laugh and you should be able to have fulfilling relationships. Uh, it, it ought to be a good time, not every minute of every day, obviously, but there's a lot of opportunity there to enjoy um, each other uh, and to laugh. And uh, it's a chance for our team members to say, hey, I'm not having fun right now. This this just got to be a little bit of a drag that the pressure's too much. Um, we're, we're focusing too hard. We, we need to take a deep breath. And, uh, and so those values really show up um, day to day in the way we're interacting um, with our clients and with each other. But one of my favorites is there's a story that uh, we all relate to at work. That's it's a podcast that's that's floated around, but it talks about a um, a factory that was trying to improve the way they were building cars, and they were having multiple defects. And um, their race was to produce as many cars as they could, but it was causing them to send cars with too many defects off the end of the line. And in an effort to improve quality, they empowered every employee to stop the line to to pull a chain that would stop the the production line so that they could yeah. fix something that wasn't right. And ultimately it, it, uh, it helped create solutions that delivered more uh, cars that had less defects um, at the end. But that idea of being able to stop the line, when we tell our team members, um, our, our first core values delight our customers every time, um, it means when you go to a job site and you look at the work you've done, step back and ask yourselves if you think you've, done work that would delight our customers and mm. if you haven't stopped the line don't yeah. don't get in the car and leave um, yeah, yeah. get 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 back out there and and um, and make sure that you've done work that you're proud of that's that's from the book on toyota i think right yeah there's a uh, a story about the numi factory and the numi factory was uh, was actually uh, a general motors uh uh saturn facility okay. and it went out of business it closed and um, and then they they partnered with Toyota and reopened it uh, to build cars again. And mm. uh, yeah, it's a uh, um, a really interesting and, and fun story. Hmm. Is that that's from the book the the uh, machine that changed the world or something? Yeah, like I, I think you're I think you're right. I um, I know it from a podcast, and um, uh, I'll send you a copy. Of the podcast is by a different name, but it was um, uh, something that our team really found. Uh, impactful. Here, here's another quick lesson from that story. Yeah. Um, the the factory that closed uh, had a union workforce, and um, and they blamed their problems on the union workforce. They couldn't fire anybody. They had what what they termed as terrible employees, um, and there was uh, was reputed that you could get um, alcohol, drugs, and sex on the factory floor um, throughout the workday. And um, that's what a mess they had on their hands. And there were people um, within GM that didn't want this new factory that was being reopened in this partnership with the Japanese. They didn't want it to succeed. And so they put a stipulation in that if Japan was going to partner with them, they had to rehire the exact same workforce and, um, and partner with them to you know, build a factory that would work. And... Um, yeah, and the the leaders from Toyota said, "Perfect. We'll we'll demonstrate exactly what we're trying to to tell you about creating an appropriate workplace and engaging people um, as a key way of building something successful." So that's part of why it resonates with our team. We love the idea that uh, it's about the system, um, yeah. and if you have the right system uh, and you don't blame the people for the problems, then uh, then you can uh, have a chance to build a great business. Love it, love it, love it, love it. You know, you that first example you gave about. Um, what was it doing fewer applications or slowing down on the service at the end of the year? You know, you might think, well, that would never happen at my company, but I just broke a relationship with my a marketing company and they started doing that to me. And I don't know if the owner knew or not, but in the end, the owner defended the person doing it. And uh, hmm. it, you know, they probably underestimated whatever they needed for me. And it just, you know, you can't make any assumptions that people are on your value set. And it just goes to show me that you really have to talk about this stuff and 
give people these guardrails and make no assumptions. I mean, I'm sure the person in this company thought that they were protecting the business and yep. the owner. I am sure yep. of it. Right. And I'm sure they were doing the right thing and, and they were probably responding to the system that they're in. Mm -hmm. um, I have another example I'll share with you. Our, um, when I first came to the company, our managers, uh, each manager that, that had a profit center, so our branch managers, were given bonuses for hitting a certain level of profitability at the end of the year. Um, but that caused them to make some short-term, many of them, not all of them, to make some short-term decisions. So um, they would cut back on services that their clients were receiving. They might skip a service altogether. Um, let's just don't do the overseeding. Or if we do the overseeding, we'll reduce the, uh, the amount of seed that we're putting down so that we can save that money. Um, mm -hmm. Maybe we'll skip uh, a last fertilization uh, before the year's over. Um, in some cases, they were deferring maintenance on their fleet um, and you know, sending trucks out with tires that needed to be replaced saying, mm -hmm. Now we'll get to that in January, uh, but let's just get through the last you know five weeks of the year and we'll save that money in an effort to you know to hit a, a profit and loss hurdle um, in their business. Obviously, those decisions are short term and will come back to haunt you in the long run. But in the short term, you know managers got their bonus and then they would start trying to figure out how to do it again the next year by by making a different set of decisions. So. Yeah. Um, Look, it's not to say that that stuff never works. You know, one of the early, um, this is years ago, but uh, early interactions you and I had was online and it, you were talking about incentives. And I said, uh, I said, hey, I've, I've got a different thought about incentives and, and whether or not they, they really work. Um, and I think you have to put so many controls around them to really get the behavior that you want. But even more importantly, um, there's a lot of studies that show that incentives uh, drive people to do the behavior to get the incentive, but they sure. don't create long-term behavior. And so if the incentive is interrupted, the behavior stops. A, a classic example is um, Pizza Hut years ago said uh, that they want to help with literacy. So um, they would give kids a personal pan pizza uh, for every book that they read in, in the elementary school. And uh, it was studied after a long period of time and um, realized that the kids who earned the most pizzas um, were not the most literate children um, going into to middle school and high school. In fact, they learned not to really have a love for reading. Um, mm. They read solely to get the prize. And yep. once the prize was removed, um, they, they didn't they hadn't developed a joy uh, for reading. And so that. Uh, um, literary skills were not enhanced. And so um, as we, you know, look at how that affects things in our business, um, we just try to drive them out. We, we, uh, we don't use incentives to motivate. We don't have variable income for anybody at Landcare um, other than corporate profit sharing. If the business does well, we share the results with our team members. Um, but it, uh, it comes out in uh, in other ways as well. You know, we, we don't publish rankings. We don't try to tell everybody who the best branch is and um, who the worst branch is and try to use things like that, which are a different form of incentive. You know, it's, it's incentivizing with um, credit uh, or um, the opposite of incentives, which um, is punishment. So instead of rewarding somebody, you punish them. You can punish them by shaming them and saying, "Well, here's our here's our lowest performing businesses," and it's a um, it's a really uh, crass way of trying to improve performance just by telling somebody, "Hey, hey, get off the bad list," uh, you know, if you don't want to um, be seen there in front of your peers. So that means that your salespeople are on profit sharing, but not commission. Am I hearing that right? Uh, they are not on commission. Our salespeople are not on commission. We, um, we really don't have people with that title in our business. Um, the vast majority of our growth comes from our account managers and branch managers. So um, we see sales in our business as not transactional relationships, mm -hmm. but as relational uh, relationships. So they are the sales that we earn uh, are through building trust with customers, not through having a, uh, a successful one-time transaction. So, so do you it takes longer. Have, yeah. Do you not have business developers on 
in any of your branches? We have very few. I mean, there is a, there's a handful across the company. It's not part of our standard model, but there are a few instances where um, people have um, really excelled in that role and are contributing at a high level there. But in those cases, they are still um, all on a, uh, a strict uh, salary as opposed to, uh, to having commissions as well. And look, our belief in, in my experience when we use commissions was that we drove a different kind of sales. Um, we had people chasing work that they could close that might not be the work that was the best for the branch to perform. Yeah. Um, so we, we divide all customer types into different market segments. And we have a primary segment, which tends to be loyal and um, appreciate what's different about land care and willing to pay a fair price. Um, and we have a uh, kind of a, a mid tier, which uh, which maybe has a little bit more variability in that definition. And then there's a low tier, which are customers that um, are really willing to use a large variety of contractors and are very very price driven. And we just don't find that uh, that we can have successful relationships there. But those jobs are often the easiest to sell. And if you're in a commission sales environment that system, again, can cause you to gravitate towards that kind of work because you're just trying to pay the bills at home. Yeah. No, I, I definitely agree with you. When I'm, as a consultant, and I deal with companies of all sizes and situations, I find that sometimes, well, the, the incentive system has to sort of grow and mature. So if I have a small company and they may or may not want to do profit sharing, but they just may not have believable numbers. And it might take a few years to even get the stability. Uh, but when they go to hire their first salesperson, you know, then I then suggest incentives and things that kind of match where they are in their system. Mm -hmm. um, I have a client, his name's Anthony. I'll keep it to first name. Mm -hmm. And man, his company is working so well. He's using profit sharing, not separate bonuses. And he called me and he's like, I'm thinking of giving this person incentive. And I'm like, don't do it. Because this it's working, you know, in probably the land, probably in your philosophy, this thing is just working so well and everyone's on board and God, it's a lot easier for him to manage. Uh, well, and we're all in the same boat together, right? So why would you put a team together and take your administrator in the office? We don't say, I'm going to pay you part of your salary. And then if you do your job extraordinarily well, then I'll give you the rest of your salary. Hmm. Um, and we don't take our production managers and say, I'm going, to, I'm going to give you part of what you deserve to earn. But then if you do these things, I'm going to give you the rest of your paycheck. We give them all of their paycheck. We expect them to do their job. We try to create a job that they're inspired by. We train them properly for it. We give them the right tools to do it. Um, and, um, and we trust that they're going to go out there and do it the, the best that they can. Why would we take one position and say, well, I don't trust that you're going to do this the best that you can. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hold something back and I'm going to dangle it as a carrot to make sure I get your best effort and you put everything you can into this job. We don't do that with any other role. I don't know why we feel, you know, uh, in this uh, culture that we need to do it with salespeople, but many, many people do. They believe that salespeople won't try their hardest uh, without a reward, um, which, it, it, I, again, I said the opposite is a punishment because if you don't hit your sales numbers, you're not able to pay your bills and so, uh, or, or meet your financial obligations. And so, yeah, reward or punishment. We think we've got to treat salespeople that way, but nobody else. And it's peculiar to me. It, it is the norm in the world, or at least in the U.S. There are a lot more companies doing things that way than the way we're doing them, which is part of why I say we're a different kind of company. We, yeah. we look at people differently and, and we think about the system that we're in. And I believe that that system, going back to that conversation around enhancement sales, you know, if you've got someone who's got multiple responsibilities, but but commissions on one aspect of it or oh, bonuses is tied to one aspect of it, then you're going to drive behavior that way. I'm totally with you. Have you read uh, Peter Senge's book, The Fifth Discipline? I have. Yeah. Yeah. That's a really big book on systems. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, it's uh, look, you find it over and over and over again. And, you know, I, I use the analogies um, uh, around getting your car repaired because most people can relate to um, at the simplest form going into having an oil change and, you know, the, the 15 minute oil change uh, a place that you pull into with your car, uh, you go sit in the lobby. And if you've been there a couple of times before, you know, you can kind of count to 10 Mississippi under your breath before someone's going to come in and wave a dirty air filter underneath you, your uh, nose and say, hey, if you don't buy this air filter, your car's going to have problems. And, you know, it's another $30. And it's, it's their high margin enhancement sale that they're highly incentivized on. Mm-hmm. And um, uh, it's not productive to feel like you're being sold things by somebody um, that you don't really trust. And uh, I think the opposite is true. You know, when you develop a relationship with someone who cares for your vehicle, um, if they call you, if, if you took it in for a brake job, but they call you and tell you you need something else, if the trust level's really high, you're going to say, thank you. I'm glad you caught that. And if the trust level's really low, you're going to say, just do the job I told you to do. And I'll go get a second opinion. And we've all had stories around that, yeah. right? Where yeah, the sure. thing that they suggested wasn't really needed, but uh, but they play on our you know our ignorance or our vulnerability to to make that buying decision, and it's why most consumers would tell you, I don't want to buy from someone who sells on commissions. I'd much rather buy from someone who is just trying to help me. Do you pay profit sharing to your frontline staff, and how does what do you how do you do that? Yeah, our profit sharing goes down to our management staff. We do not include our hourly staff. and That's a goal um, going forward to expand to that group. Um, yeah. And I think we'll get there if, if not next year and the year after. Um, but it is uh, it's something that we haven't brought to that level yet and is part of our management team's objectives. It's one of the last pieces that has any differentiation between the frontline worker and the, you know, the top level employees in the company. Mm, yeah. Now, there's other ways to reward frontline that can be monetary, but doesn't have to be money. And so I'll be curious to see how you how you uh, thread that needle. And yeah, I've, I've talked about some of the other things that, that we've done as a company. So expanding uh, holidays, providing PTO, um, you know, full uniforms, including boots, um, just different things that make um an impact on our team members in the field. One of the things that's really cool, Jeffrey, if I could uh, segue for a minute into uh, something entirely different. We looked hard at um, some of the things that our the uh, employees enjoy in their lives and some of the things that they find challenges with and asked what we could do to help that. And we created a foundation at Landcare that is, uh, it's called LEAF. And it's an acronym that stands for the Land Care Education Assistance Foundation. Um, mm-hmm. So it's money that our owners, which are you know our, our team members, have put our personal funds into, and it's created to help our frontline get their children into college. So one aspect of that would be um, uh, college scholarships, but another is helping them find other scholarships that are available for them, mm-hmm. uh, and there yeah. are many. And uh, another is to make sure they're on the path to college in the first place. So we start with early education and are working all the way through uh, the children of our team members that have so many hurdles standing between them and higher education. So it's a, um, a new program. Uh, I'm really proud of the work that we're doing, but it's another way of saying, hey, we're taking the responsibility of making this a great place to work and truly impacting our employees in a positive way. I think the last thing you wanted to talk about was the the platinum rule that you use with clients. Yeah, I um, uh, I think about helping uh, great companies help people lead great lives. And I don't think that applies to just our employees. I think it applies to our customers as well um, and our vendors. Um, but it's being thoughtful about everybody and um, and what we can do to give them the most positive experience possible. And you know, one of the things that we heard growing up, many of us, is the golden rule, uh, which is to treat others the way you want to be treated. And it it causes you to stop and ask yourself, you know, would I would I like it if somebody did that to me? Um, so 
the platinum roll is the uh, uh, the next iteration of that, and it's one that resonates with me. And that's to treat people the way they want to be treated. So not the way you want to be treated, but the way they want to be treated. It mm -hmm. means you've got to have dialogue with them. Uh, you've got to really connect with them to understand what's important to them personally, and then to tailor the things that you do in a way that that respects that and shows that you care. And I think it's just a higher level of customer service. We're um, engaged in this idea of hospitality and how our business is really a hospitality business and how we can use that platinum rule to better understand our customers and, and uh, provide to them what's important to them. It, it sounds like the way you treat your employees. It's the way I think we should treat everybody, right? Uh, uh, team members, um, customers, vendors, treat them the way that they would want to be treated. And uh, it, it implies uh, having to be very intentional, but also having to take the time to understand others. So how do you train your staff on implementing this? It, it's about asking questions. It's about listening. It's the, you know, all the things that we've heard, you got two ears and, and one mouth. So don't do as much telling as you do listening. Try to understand what's important to them. Um, you know, sometimes as landscape professionals, we think what we do is all about the landscape and um, all about the way the plants look. But really, it's about how we make our customers feel. They mm -hmm. want to feel heard. They want to feel listened to. Um, they want to know that we're getting through on the things that are important to them. Mm -hmm. um, I've lost uh, work on jobs that look like a million bucks. I mean, they are, they are as close to Disneyland as you can get, but we haven't been listening to the customer and we haven't served them in the way that they want to be served. And frankly, I've kept jobs that we're not doing our best landscape work on, but we've done a great job of developing a deep relationship with the client. And at the end of the day, I think that requires um, um, listening and, uh, and creating that dialogue and being really intentional in the way you interact with someone else. Verbal skills, emotional intelligence. Um, I suppose in your system, not having a commission on that next sale, right? Being able to stop the line. I think all of those things are really important. And if your customer feels like the um, the enhancement that you're trying to sell them is to help you meet a goal, it's not nearly as impactful as they feel like, uh, if they feel like you're trying to help them solve a problem. Yeah. Yeah, that's how I, I mean, that's how I have grown my consulting practice. And that's how I, I really talk to other owners about their salespeople. They should be consultants. They should be there trying to help the other person's life or business or whatever improve. Absolutely. Right? Yeah. I love that. This has been great. Any we've gone, uh, we've spent a lot of time here, you know, I was thinking, Hey, this will, we'll hop on and we'll do a number, you know, a second follow up. Yeah. I didn't know if we'd get a full hour out of it, but um, here's what I, I believe. I think you got uh, a better feel for kind of what, what makes us tick and, and, um, you know, what is truly uh, a little bit different about Landcare than you're going to find um, just in any other company that you might look deeply at. And uh, when you get to businesses our size, it seems like there's a lot of similarities, but I think there's some really key differences down inside that, um, that drive us and, uh, and really guide our decisions day in and day out. So thanks for giving me a chance to share it. Yeah, hopefully this will become a, a tool for you like if I was thinking of working for your company, man, I can go listen to the owner talk. Um, but, you know, I do think what you're saying is true in that our industry is really headed, you know, we're on this train, this private equity train going in one direction. And so it's maybe even easier now than it was five years ago to separate yourself and from everyone else. Yeah, and I think give people a chance to um, zero in on what's important to them. Uh, and what they want to be part of and um, and know that there's options out there, right? That there's not everything only uh, heading in one direction, that there's um, there's still people that see things in a different way. Look, we're definitely not the only ones. There's a, a lot of peers I have that share those thoughts and ideas and um, and are building their companies in a similar way and, and really looking long-term yeah. um, at what they can do with their business. And um, I think that's the, the fun thing. You know, you mentioned potential employees listening, but uh, for me, it's always sharing 
Uh, I've, I've gained so much from those willing to share with me over yeah. the years yeah. um, around our association that, man, if I can share something with somebody else, I'm, I'm just happy to. Well, thank you. Thank you for doing that here on this podcast. Mike, I really appreciate it. I've gotten to know you better as well. And this is, uh, you've got an exciting business uh, that it's like you're just beginning. You know, I, I really get that yeah. sense of energy. So. I do too. And we're, we're super excited about uh, where we're going next and uh, where this journey will take us, but enjoying every step of the way. So thanks for inviting me back and um, um, anytime, uh, happy to check back in with you. Thank you. Thanks, Jeffrey.